check, check, testing, one, two, check. Check, check, testing, one, two. Good morning. It's good to be with you today in our worship service. Welcome. I want to uh, share in just a few announcements before we begin our worship service. Uh, first of all, we continue on a weekly basis to have our Wednesday morning uh, prayer group. Uh, it's on Zoom. Uh, all are invited. Uh, the link is sent out to each uh, Tuesday afternoon for that. Uh, also, uh, just to mention, we will be having a cluster-wide Ash Wednesday service. Of course, that is on Ash Wednesday, which is on February 22nd. It'll be at 7 o'clock, and it'll be at the Dallas United Methodist Church. Uh, we did this last year for the first time, and uh, what a glorious experience that was uh, to be able to be in worship with others uh, here in the uh, Back Mountain churches, and uh, just a, a great uh, service overall. So encourage you, if you can, to make some time to be with us Again, that's on Ash Wednesday, 7 o'clock at Dallas United Methodist Church. Uh, also, a couple other things I wanted to mention. Uh, there's Easter. We're talking Easter already. Uh, the Easter flower order form is on the uh, back table uh, where you signed in. Uh, so feel free, if you would, to pick one up. I think it was also in the uh, mailing that was sent this past week, too. So you can use that form as well. Uh, and also... Um, Oh, there it is. The grief support group uh, at Shavertown United Methodist Church begins uh, this Thursday, uh, February 16th. I don't know the time of it for sure, but you can call Shavertown just to ask that. Uh, but it's for anybody that is still struggling with grief. If you know somebody, uh, uh, even a friend or a neighbor, please pass that information on to them as well. I know we've had some of our folk who have attended who have certainly benefited from the uh, grief support uh, program. Just a couple library notes. Um, this or th is it this Thursday, the 23rd? Is that this? Thursday? No, it's next Thursday. So a week from this coming Thursday, the 23rd, there will be a discussion in the evening on the book "Same Kind of Different as Me," and then uh, the next morning uh, begins a uh, study on the 24 Hours that Changed the World, and that'll be on Friday mornings at 10. So some opportunities there for you. I wanted to also mention, uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Oh, there you go. Uh, the uh, Lenten series that we're going to have coming up. Uh, this will be both in our worship services during the season of Lent, and then also uh, Bible study opportunities or small group discussion opportunities, 10 o'clock in the morning in person, and then also 7 o'clock in the evening, both in person and online. I, I really firmly believe that this is an area where God is leading us as a congregation. And what I mean by that is um, uh, you see all kinds of statistics that talk about the number of people who are either are unchurched or not connected in any way in their faith. And that number continues to grow exponentially, which means there's quite a few people uh, in our area uh, who have no connection at all in their faith. Uh, we're called to be disciples who in turn make disciples. And so the thrust of the uh, book that it's based upon, Get Their Name, is really uh, all about uh, reaching out to folks uh, who uh, are unchurched, uh, putting ourselves in places where uh, we will be around folks that are unchurched, or uh, even being able to express our, our faith in a way 
that can be inviting too. So I encourage you to be involved, whether it's in our worship services on a weekly basis, in one of the study group opportunities, or even purchase the book yourself and read that uh, so that uh, you may be more informed. If you have any questions at all about that, I'd certainly be glad to answer that. But I encourage you to be as engaged as possible with uh, that. Any other announcements that we need to share? Very good. Well, we'll continue our worship service as we uh, hear the uh, ringing of the bells and then as we share in our morning prelude today. I invite you to stand if you are able and join in our opening hymn. It's number 600 in the red hymnal if you'd like to follow along or the words will be on the screen. Uh, wonderful words of life. the blessed one gives to all wonderful words of life sinner list to the loving call wonderful words of life all 
If you would remain standing and join me in affirming your faith with the words from an affirmation of faith in 1 Timothy. There is one God and there is one mediator, Christ Jesus, who came as a ransom for all to whom we testify. This saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners and was manifested in the flesh, vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed in throughout the world, taken up in glory. Great indeed is the mystery of the gospel. Amen. I invite our children to come forward. The rest of you, I invite you to be seated. So if you would go to the next slide, please. What emotion, or what's that person feeling in those pictures? Go ahead. Angry. Can you think of something that would make us angry? Christian's smiling already. <laughs> what makes you angry, Christian? Not getting ice cream, that is a good thing to be angry about. Yes. Not getting what you want. Mm -hmm. Somebody picking on us, maybe. Maybe somebody hitting us. I know that doesn't happen with siblings, right? I remember it did with my brothers and my sister. So, oh yeah. So those things kind of make us angry, right? Um, so I want you, as you think about these pictures, and maybe think about the times that you're angry, what's going on in your mind at that point in time? What are you thinking? Thinking what you should do next? Okay. Someone shared last night at our worship service, sometimes we're thinking about how can I get that person back, right? Yeah. So it, um, when we're this angry, it really does kind of occupy our minds. How about our hearts? What are we thinking? What are we feeling there? What's that? Starts beating faster. Someone last night said the same thing. Yeah. I didn't even think about that. I was thinking more along, you know, our, our hearts, you know, with our minds, uh, we experience that anger, and it just doesn't feel right, does it? And a lot of times when we're angry, we do things impulsively. You ever heard that word before? 
Nick, do you know what the word impulsive means? Okay. So what it means is you react real quick. So in other words, if somebody does something to you, a lot of times we just respond. We do something back or we say something or we, um, you know, we react rather quickly. And that's, what's, that's what it means by impulsive. So I want us to think about, if you go to the next slide, the power of pause. There's all kinds of uh, articles, um, you know, little video clips, uh, I think even books written about the power of pause. And if nothing else, that helps us to kind of get control of some of the, mo the emotions that we have in just that moment. So in other words, rather than react impulsively, rather than just respond to someone out of anger, we take a moment to pause. And I want to share with you a couple of examples. Uh, to me, one of the best ways to take a pause is to take a deep breath. So we're going to do that right now. Everybody ready? Take a deep breath. Breathe in through your nose. Breathe out through your mouth. Let's do it one more time. I don't know about you, but that calms me immediately. So even when you're angriest, maybe one of the things you could do, take a deep breath. Another one, close your eyes. And then we don't see the person who's irritating us or bothering us. Uh, we don't see the situation that we're in. And maybe it even allows us to focus on something else. Take a walk. Or maybe take a run. Uh, if something's bothering you so much, just walk away. Try to gather your composure a little bit. And then this is exercising, okay? And these are some different things. I, um, Jennifer Reinheimer had this posted on her Facebook page yesterday, so I pulled it up. And these were uh, quick ways to calm down, okay? So one is called puffer fish puff. You puff your cheeks like a puffer fish and fill your cheeks with all... Air, with air and hold for five seconds. So be like this. <sighs> oh, who's counting? That's terrible. I don't really like that one, but that might work for you. It all, it did, all it made me do is feel a little dizzy. So, um, The starfish tr tr stretch, it says... Stretch out your, stretch out like a starfish. We're going to try this, okay? Don't hit your brother or sister, though. Place your arms up over your head and stretch out wide. Stretch your legs out wide, too. Aren't you more relaxed already? Calm? You're still doing the puffer fish. All right, if that works for you, that's good. But there's different things that we can do just to take us out of that moment. One of the things I like to do is listen to music. So music that kind of calms me. Uh, it was amazing whenever I was growing up as a child, um, from Thanksgiving through January, we had Christmas music on. And, and I tell you, you know, having that on in the background always tended to you know, take us out of that moment and cause us to be a little bit nicer to each other. Uh, so I'd like to listen to some Christian music too, but maybe you have uh, some music that you could listen to that calms you as well. So I want you to think about that the next time you're angry. Don't react right away. Don't react impulsively, right? But think about ways to take a moment to pause, get control of your emotions.
so that you're able to respond in a more positive way. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of this day and for this time, Lord, that we have to gather here. And we thank you, Lord, for just uh, some of the ways in which you help us in our lives uh, to calm down when we're faced with difficult situations or, uh, Lord, to, to somehow uh, get rid of some of the um, angry feelings or thoughts that we may have. So, Lord, help us to uh, embrace the power of pause. Go with us on this day. For these things, Lord, we ask in your name. Amen. So when you're watching the Super Bowl tonight, okay, and say if uh, one of your parents or whoever you're with gets all upset, just say, take a deep breath. Okay? Just don't get yourself in trouble. <laughs> Have a good day. They say after uh, the Super Bowl um, that uh, the uh, um, sales of TVs go up in the air then too. These kind of skyrocket because somebody's gotten so mad they've thrown something at the TV. So we're going to move into a, a time of prayer. Maybe. I wasn't able to make a copy today, so I'm dependent upon my phone. All right, there we go. <clears throat> I want to begin by sharing in some joys. Uh, we give thanks to God for all of those that have made a difference in our lives. We talked about that last week. And the challenge that comes to us from God to uh, embrace Christ-like qualities in our own lives so that we in turn can make a difference in the lives of others. And perhaps during our prayer time today, uh, you want to shout out a couple of those names of folks that have made a difference in your life. I, I see we have uh, some of our Florida folks back. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't have any snow to greet you upon your arrival. Uh, and I understand next week we're 60 degrees. So you guys did a nice job bringing back some warm weather too. Thank you. Welcome home. Also, praise for the many ways in which we've experienced or witnessed God's healing power. I'd ask prayer for those who have recently lost loved ones, for those who continue to grieve the death of loved ones, for the uh, Tim Burdick family and friends, Zachary Leonard, Dorothy Walrich, Joe Broody, and then certainly uh, our hearts go out to uh, the people of uh, Turkey and Syria. And what a tragedy uh, that is, and uh, just amazing to uh, think about that. Uh, I think our last death toll I heard was over 25,000 folks. Um, by the way, there are some that have asked about uh, how to respond to that. Uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief is always a good way to do that. If anybody would like to make a special offering to that, just make it out to the church, but write on the uh, check or on the envelope, UMCOR, U-M-C-O-R, uh, United Methodist Committee on Relief, and that will make sure that it gets there. Uh, UMCOR is already involved there uh, through some of the grants that uh, they provide uh, to buy some of the things that are much needed uh, most at this point in time. We lift up uh, those from our church family, uh, Bonnie Peka, Wayne and Diane Long, Madeline Root, Jeff Spinici, uh, Gail Kissler, Bob Shoemaker, Jack and Noreen Celerari, Rick and Susie O'Donnell, and uh, Sally, we're praying for you and Frank as well. Uh, those from our uh, extended church family, uh, Brian Hunsinger, uh, from Joyce Pace for Jeannie, uh, the Tonart family, Denise Mazza, Joan Burdick, Josh Ballera, 
Kylie Carol Abbott and Hugh Kapalka. And then we continue to uh, pray for Chuck and Vi. Great to have Chuck and Vi with us in worship. Ken and Judy, great to have Ken with us as well. Let's move into a time of prayer. And uh, again, in the midst of the prayer, I'll just allow a, a time for uh, silence, but uh, call upon any of you. If you want to remember anybody that's uh, uh, had an impact upon your faith journey, uh, shout those out at this point in time. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord God, we thank you for the gift of this day, for the opportunity to gather together as family, friends, loved ones. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate your love in our lives, for the impact, Lord, that your love continues to have in our lives. And Lord, for your call to each of us to live Christ-like lives, to not allow anger, negative thoughts to control who we are, but instead, Lord, to lean upon your word, to marvel in your love, and to be Christ-like in all that we do, say, and think. Lord, as we gather together on this day, we celebrate those who have had an impact upon our faith journey. Lord, hear us as we share some of those names at this time. Francie Walk for my parents. Lord, we thank you for these folks who have made a difference in our lives and help us in our faith journey now as we share uh, in relationship with others, that we may help make a difference in their lives as well. Lord, you've heard some of our prayers for those who are hurting. Our hearts especially go out to the people of Turkey and Syria, to all of those who are responding to this disaster. Lord, we pray that your presence, your power, and your love would be made known. Lord, continue to bless us in this time of worship. Inspire us to be your church alive in the world today. For these things we ask in your name. Amen. Two things I realize I just skipped over after the uh, children's moment. Uh, recognizing our fantasy football league. I'm going to call Lou up here at this time. Lou, I kind of have a list on two slides there, too, if you want to say anything at all. And they kind of are in reverse order, if you understand what I mean. All right. Oh, wait, get, get behind a microphone, if you would, please. Yeah. There all right. So we had... 14 participants in our league this year. So we had, let's see here, I'm looking at the, the list here on my phone. Read off. Okay. So we had Ian Hastings, Jacob Kuzinko, Kevin Klein, oh, it's his Katie's team, uh, Gary Van Deutsch, Zach Colkins, uh, the Eckenrodes, then myself, Mark Humphrey Jr., Jay Jones, uh, Mike Griffith, Tyler, and uh, Tracy Marger. So, the, the final three this year, Mark Humphrey finished third, uh, manager of the Kingston Crunch. Uh, Old Stonehand, this is myself, is number two. And this year's champ is uh, TUMC GW's gang, Lori Pettit. So congratulations, Lori. 
I don't see her here, but um, what we did is there's a $10 entry fee, and the, the winner gets to choose a um, something to donate it to. So this year, actually, Lori sent me a text message this morning. She said she wants to donate to the, the Loose Bossiano General Fund, which I, I graciously accept. So, no, she, she uh, is donating to the uh, TUMC, the food pantry. So uh, we'll be collecting the money, and Lori will be making the donation <coughs> in the near future. Thanks, Lou. Let me also uh, thank Lou for uh, coordinating that. Uh, this is our second year that we've done it. I think last year we had 10 teams. This year we had uh, 14, so that was great. Lori also uh, shared with me a couple of other things then, too. First of all, again, her team's name was uh, GW, what was it, GW, oh, T-U-M-C, GW's Gang. Uh, the GW actually is uh, a nickname that her dad had. And uh, so that's, uh, his name was George Washington. And so uh, she uh, did that in honor of him. Uh, she also chose the food bank because of him. Uh, he was, uh, she said, uh, uh, he, he was involved in its infancy, and uh, he loved uh, the food bank. Uh, she also said uh, she gets her love of football from him. And if any of you have ever had a conversation with Lori about football, she knows a whole lot about football, obviously. So, again, congratulations. Uh, as we mentioned that, our uh, mission of the month is also the uh, Back Mountain Food Pantry. So uh, that's uh, quite a, uh, a coincidence, maybe, or a God moment. At this time, I'm going to invite our ushers to come as we uh, share in our morning offering. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for the gift of this day and for the challenge, Lord, that as we embrace your love, peace may begin with us. Lord, uh, bless these gifts, bless those who give, challenge us always to be your church. For these things we do ask in your name. Amen. Believe our spirit singers have a song this time.
gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment, and if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may, be hand, may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, spirit singers. Appreciate that. Will you pause with me for a moment of prayer? Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of each of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Go to the first slide, please. I want to speak this morning about grudges. The definition of grudge is a feeling of deep-seated resentment or ill will. And when I think about uh, grudges, I think of this question. Who does a grudge affect more than anybody else? You and me, right? The one holding the grudge. I want to share uh, some quotations about the grudges. Uh, I don't have them on the screen, but I will uh, provide them in an email uh, sometime this week. Greg McKeon says this about grudges. What job have I hired this grudge to do? That was a great question to begin with. What's the purpose? Steve Maraboli says, Life is what happens when you're wasting time holding a grudge against people who aren't spending a single moment thinking about you. Sherry Lynn Kenyon, in a book, One Silent Night, says this about grudges. Take it from someone who knows firsthand. There's a lot to be said for forgiveness. Grudges seldom hurt anyone except the one bearing them. And finally, from Mary Haskell, the castle behind thorns. You misunderstood the point of forgiveness entirely. The only cage that a grudge creates is around the holder of the grudge. Forgiveness is not saying that the person who hurt you was right or has earned it or is allowed to hurt you again. All forgiveness means is that you will carry on without the burdens of rage or hatred. I thought all of these were really powerful words to hear about grudges. They are great words to hear, but perhaps they're much harder to live out. I read an article by Brian Robinson from a February 2022 Forbes magazine the article focuses on the mental, physical, and emotional effects of grudges. And he cites from research 
in a survey of 2,000 adults conducted by Trust Pilots Helping Hands. Listen to some of these statistics. 69% of those surveyed had a lingering gripe of some sort. Think about that. 69% had a lingering gripe of some sort. 70% of those surveyed believed that holding a grudge was bad for their health. We do a lot of other things that are bad for our health too, but that's a pretty high number as well. 20% of those surveyed believed that holding a grudge affected their mental health. And then 53% of those surveyed believed that they were too quick to hold a grudge. Some eye-opening statistics for sure. Robinson adds, research shows harboring resentment erodes your mental and physical health, consuming your thoughts, keeping the hurt at the center of your daily activities, weighing you down and depleting energy that could be channeled into more positive and creative directions. Grudges can even morph into depression, interfering with job productivity and disconnecting you from coworkers, friends, and family. I want to take it one step farther. I can also suggest from personal experience as a pastor of 35 years, I have done more than my fair share of funeral services where there is a rift in the family, where something recent or something years before caused a division within the family that was never resolved. And that division is always obvious. When you walk into a funeral home, perhaps, and uh, one side of the family is on one side of the funeral home, the other side of the family is on the other side of the funeral home. Generally, there's no communication or eye contact between sides. It's a sad situation to experience at a time where they should be helping each other through grief. but I've seen that all too often. And then, as if our physical and emotional well-being is not enough of a reason to let go of grudges and to offer forgiveness, we hear today's text. Jesus says in today's passage that as Christians... We are judged by God when we hold a grudge against another. As a matter of fact, Jesus says that those who are angry with a brother or sister are liable to judgment just like those we judge who are convicted of murdering another. Wow. That's Hard to hear. For what Jesus is saying is that God judges our actions, our behaviors, our responses, and all of our thoughts and feelings, including the resentment and ill will that we direct to another. <coughs> Here's how Jason Dexter in Study and Obey says it. Our relationships are very important. And we place a high priority on maintaining healthy and unified relationships with others. This even takes priority over doing spiritual religious activities. Now let me make sure that that's understood. 
for any who uh, engaged in our worship service last weekend, it's uh, much the same as what we talked about uh, last weekend. Um, Dexter is referring to our going through the motions with the spiritual and religious activities. Things like worship and study and prayer and daily devotions. Dutifully sharing in these disciplines while maintaining a grudge with another. We know from our own experience, holding grudges necessarily affects our relationship with God. Even as we were reflecting in the children's moment, when you're angry that just uh, does something to your thinking, to your mind. It continually is present. And our hearts are nowhere close to being where God wants them to be. We need reconciliation for our physical, emotional, and spiritual health. And I believe we could learn something from our Amish brothers and sisters. Many of you here are old enough to remember the tragedy that took place in one of our Amish one-room schoolhouses. It happened in Pennsylvania, Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, near Lancaster, in October of 2006. An Amish milk truck driver, in a fit of rage, entered the school, dismissed all of the adults and the boys, and then shot the remaining ten girls. Five of them died, the others were wounded. And then the shooter took his own life. This horrific tragedy caused much shock for all concerned and particularly for those most affected. But there was an even greater shock. For within hours of the devastation, the Amish community expressed their forgiveness of the shooter and reached out to the shooter's family that he left behind. Many in the Amish community attended the burial of the shooter. In addition, with some of the donations that poured in from the world to the Amish community, a portion of that was allotted to the shooter's family to help care for their needs. Incredible. One year after the tragedy, Stephen A. Nolt um, spent some time in the Amish community and he wrote an article entitled, The Amish Remind Us All That Forgiveness Is Possible. He spent some time with some of the families of the victims of the shooting, as well as some of the town folk. He interviewed over three dozen people in and around Nickel Mines. And then he wrote this. We found that their decision to forgive was instinctive and that their commitment to forgive was communal. Those elements, in turn, carried them during a difficult emotional process of forgiveness that is ongoing. I think that's key to understanding. They were able to forgive, but the emotional impact still remains, and they're still working on that. He added, emotional forgiveness is hard. And then I love this quotation. 
So rather than allowing feelings to direct one's way of living, Amish culture encourages living one's way into new feelings. A grieving grandfather asked by reporters less than 48 hours after two of his granddaughters had been slain if he had forgiven the killer responded in my heart yes and I think that response just perfectly encapsulates the, the approach in my mind Christ like approach of the Amish community they decided even as a community that they would forgive the shooter but they would spend the rest of their days living into the emotional acceptance of that. So rather than allowing feelings to direct one's way of living, Amish culture encourages living one's way into new feelings. And that way of living is like Jesus. Even on the cross, who said these words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. One more quotation about um, grudges from Sonia Choquette. If we think of our life as a journey... We don't want to move into our future lugging along the heavy baggage of our past. One way to lighten the load is to work on forgiveness and acceptance. And that will lead us into our closing hymn. But before we enter into our closing hymn, you may have noticed that we didn't close our prayer time by praying the Lord's Prayer. But I did that intentionally because I wanted to point out that each and every time we pray that prayer, there's a phrase in there that we oftentimes gloss over. We say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Will you join with me in praying our Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Appropriately enough, our closing hymn is, Help Us Accept Each Other. And I want to call your attention in the third verse. Uh, remember those words as we talk a little bit more about uh, forgiveness and holding grudges. Uh, the hymn number in your hymn book is number 560 if you'd like to follow along, but the words will also be on the screen. I invite you to stand if you are able and join in singing. accepted us teach us as sister brother each person to embrace be present Lord among us and bring us to believe we are our 
ourselves accepted and meant to love and live. Teach us, O oh Lord, your lessons as in our daily life we struggle to be human and search for hope and faith. Teach us to care for people, for all, not just for some, to love them as we find them or as they acceptance change us so that we may be moved in living situations to do the truth in love to practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing heart. Lord, for today's encounters with all who are in need, who hunger for acceptance, for righteousness and bread, we need new eyes for New hands for holding on, renew with your spirit, Lord, free us, make us one. Just a real quick uh, thought then, too, if uh, anybody that has uh, dressed in their colors or has a jersey or whatever, if you want to join us for a quick picture uh, right after the service, that would be great then, too. Thank you. Again, verse 3. <clears throat> Let your acceptance change us so that we may be moved in living situations to do the truth in love. And then listen to this. To practice your acceptance until we know by heart the table of forgiveness and laughter's healing art. Sounds just like the approach of the Amish community to make that decision to move towards forgiveness and realize that the emotional part will be something that continues until they're able to come to terms with that with Jesus. Go now, knowing that as we leave this place, God goes with us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Together all God's people said, Amen. I invite you, if you would, to be seated.